Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. We are here without Wi-Fi in the middle of the desert, in the middle of a California heat wave, wildfires, 118 degrees, scorched earth everywhere you look. The smell of sulfur or burning, the brown landscape just being charred in front of your own eyes. But that's where we've chosen to make our stand from. That's where we've chosen to plant our flag here in the middle of the desert, literally on the surface of Mars. I'll be here for a few more months and then I have to rejoin society little by little. Um, thank you to everybody who came out to the Stress Factory in New Jersey. We had a lot of fun. That is the club in America right now that I believe, and this is from other people that have done this as well, that is really uh, having the best results with an outdoor setup. The Stress Factory, the owner of any brand, put a lot of money into an outdoor, fully functional comedy club. You have 150 seats, you have lighting, you have sound, you have everything that would make uh, a regular comedy club. It really feels like you're at a festival, like an outdoor festival. Uh, it's a great experience. And we sold out four shows there immediately. And for everyone that, you know, didn't get in, that wanted to get in, we'll be back, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later. More shows are being announced. We're back out on the road. You know, things are opening up. A lot of comedy clubs are opening up at 50% capacity. Uh, some are socially distanced. And I mean, this is what we're going to have to do. You know, in the beginning, I said, I'm not going to be out on the road. We didn't know what the hell was going on. Um, I still don't want to perform in front of cars. I still don't want to perform on the street. I don't want to perform in the middle of a park. I mean, these are, I'm not saying I'll never perform at one of those car things. I'm a little curious, but I don't, I, I just don't want to do it. And because the show is, you know, very successful and we can be funny on this show, uh, we don't need to do it, thankfully. But um, now that things are opening up, I got to go back out and be a comedian. That's part, that's part of what I do. It's part of the attack uh, plan here, you know, and um, we're doing it as safely as we can. I mean, the numbers are going down, even in the states that are hot, you know. Now, the, the COVID craziness has become QAnon for the left. This is what it is. It's my aunt calls me about it. She starts quoting models and doctors from other countries and 80,000, 30,000 to beds in the ER and you don't understand a latency peer. I mean, you know, it's become a QAnon movement for the left, the, the insanity and the obsession with COVID. I'm not saying to not be careful. I'm not saying it isn't real. I'm not saying I can't get it and drop dead tomorrow. All of these things could happen. What I am saying is that this incessant need and desire to sit at home, drink wine, and imagine worst case scenarios is infecting the body politic and it's not healthy. I'm just saying that on both sides, on QAnon, kids in the tunnels, and on everybody's going to get COVID and nobody's going to be able to draw a single breath, that they are both unhealthy extremes where people are imagining the worst over and over again. Any boomer that is plugged into politics heavily is Q or COVID. That is it. Truly, that is where they live. They're either hardcore Q or hardcore COVID. You know who they are. They might be your parents, your aunt, your uncle. They call you up and they have statistics. When somebody has statistics ready, mm -hmm. it's a problem. Okay? If you're out to dinner with someone and they start talking about a chart... <laughs> it's not going to be a good night. If they bring out a model, my aunt called me, I'm in a car, I'm in a car, I'm in a cab. On the way back, I'm with Dan who opened for me um, and we're on the way back to the house and uh, my aunt calls me, starts talking about models. So it's talking to me about the, the model they've built and the COVID deaths and what's going to happen and where we're all going and, and I'm like, I'm kind of laughing and the cab driver's laughing too because it's like no one fucking knows anything about anything here. The, the one thing that we've proven over the last fucking six months is that nobody really knows anything. Some people have been more right than others, 
but we're still figuring out what the fuck's going on. Supposedly, doctors now have a better way to treat this. They have a cocktail of drugs. Uh, they're using ventilators as a last resort. Listen, I'm not telling anybody what risks you should take or what you shouldn't take, but there's a whole hell of a lot of people in this country that never got a fucking quarantine. They've been fucking working. Have you gone through a Del Taco? They've been at work. Have you gone to a hospital? They've been at work when they're not TikToking. Have you gone to a fucking store, a grocery store? They've been at work. A lot of people have been at work. So it's time to start dipping our toe back out there and going back to work. There's no other option. There's no other option. You can't sit around and and wait for a, a, a vaccine that may never come, which I don't personally really want to put synthetic coronavirus in me. I've never gotten a flu vaccine. I've never had the flu. I don't want to walk into a Walgreens and get shot up with synthetic coronavirus. Some people do, and that's great. But I personally, at this moment in my life, maybe I'll regret that decision. That's what's great about decisions. You may regret them, you may not. But I mean, is anybody excited about the coronavirus vaccine? I'm excited about the idea of there being a vaccine. No one's excited for that needle. Nobody. I don't care who you are. Nobody's excited for it. You like the idea of it? You yeah. want other people getting it? Give it to everyone else. I want to go to dinner. Give it to everyone else, but not one person. When you imagine the vaccine, it's kind of hilarious. You imagine it as like this fucking concept that you're never going to really have to get right. in line to get. I imagine the coronavirus vaccine is something I read about in the news and go, oh, good, good, good. The more seats are open and whatever. I don't want to go to sh show up to LabCorp and get a needle in my ass with Bill Melinda Gates. That's just, so we think about the vaccine. It's like an idea that is a positive idea for society overall, but for me personally and a lot of people that I know and that I talk to, nobody's running out of their house demanding to be one of the first fucking trials of this thing. Nobody wants it. You know, we need it, and I hope some people get it, but I don't want to get it. Let the other people get it. You know, the others. I'm not saying racially. <laughs> Give it to the elderly. They're on their way out. Let them see if it works. See if it works. I don't know. People with pre-existing conditions, maybe they need it and want it. And it's, I'm just saying that we're back out on the road. Dates are coming. Tickets sell out fast. People are hungry. They want to get out. They want to have fun. You know, we, 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 we're not doing meet and greets. We're not be, we're being careful. All these comedians that are shitting on people on the road are usually comedians that have never been on the road, you know? And they're like, oh, these comedians are back on the road. I'm like, you've never been on the road. What are you, you no one's coming. What are you upset about? You know, listen, throughout this whole process, I never judged one motherfucker that went to work. I wasn't doing it. Like, I'm not judging you if, if, if you put a needle in your ass the minute that the vaccine debuts at wherever the fuck they're going to start <laughs> letting people get it. McDonald's. I don't know. But I, I don't judge any. I'm going what I'm going to do. And what I'm going to do is now kind of go out because I've seen numbers and I've seen things that lead me to believe this is the appropriate time to begin to start going out. But when they were, there were comics out three months ago, I didn't judge them. You do what you got to do. You, if you're earning money in live situations only or even just primarily, you got to do what you got to do. I don't judge anybody. You know, I mean, a lot of people have been working. Cops have been working, right? I mean, there's many videos of them <laughs> doing their jobs. Police in major cities working. God, man, I saw that video where they put a hood over a guy's head and then they, the guy suffocates and then they push him into the ground. And it's like, what? what is the excuse for that behavior. I mean, truly. The guy who was sick, maybe he had corona, he had something they didn't want to, I, I don't know what the argument's yeah, going to be. he was yelling he had COVID-19, so they put a spit hood on him to protect themselves. This was back in March, yeah. Yeah, is part of the, is part of the uh, med medication for COVID-19 slamming a guy into the ground? Like, and then the guy suffocates. Man, right. I mean, it, 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 the country's going to burn. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. Like, you watch some of these videos, and they are fucking wild. And they're, they're you, don't, you don't know what's going on. 
and I talk about this in my act, and I'm not going to give away this joke, but I would like to defend more police, but a lot of the people I know personally, and I've said it before on the show, that have co- that are cops that have guns should not have guns. So I do understand that there's we, the screening process for the cops is apparently, I know people are going to email me and go, it's actually great. Well, it clearly isn't. There's clearly a problem for smashing people into the ground. You know, we don't need to put hoods on people. I mean, what, what? I mean, this is like, this is the way Ellen DeGeneres treats her staff. That's how bad it is, putting hoods on people. It's not right. We were just in the, uh, the party store. We go to these dumb Halloween pop-ups a lot of times. You know, one of the things about being in L.A. proper was that there was a lot of costume shops. There's a lot of places. You know, the coronavirus costume, the Epstein Temple costume. We had actual costume designers design those costumes because they have to be really cool to look at, but they also have to be durable. We get in and out of cars. We're all over the place. And um, that was a benefit of being in LA but now we're in the desert you got to go to these Halloween pop-up stores and uh, we're at this pop-up store just looking at stuff you know might make stuff might not and I'm I'm looking at uh, this uh, section of the store and I'm seeing inflatable boom box I'm seeing gold chains I'm seeing hoop earrings and I'm going this Halloween's gonna go bad for some people I'm telling you that right now. I don't know what section I was in, but that was the section of the Halloween pop-up where you're going to lose your job. That was the section. If you're white, I'm just saying, whether you agree with it or not, just don't show up with hoop earrings and an inflatable boom box to the office party this year. Let's just let this year be the year you do cat ears. Do sexy cat. Don't show up with gold chains and dress up as Run DMC this year at the holiday party. Race relations are not at the best moment they've been. Just a little advice from me to you. I know, I know, cultural appropriation is kind of BS and blah, blah. I'm just saying for your own advice out there, this is really not the Halloween to be... Are they still making <laughs> cop uniforms, by the way, for Halloween? I think we saw one. Yeah, I think we did. I mean, good luck. <laughs> good luck going as sexy Derek Chauvin this year uh, for Halloween, by the way. <laughs> I bet those cop uniforms are going to take a hit. Some people will dress their kids up as cops. We support the police. Blue lives matter. You know, there's some poor kid who's like, I want to be a vampire. And they're like... You're not going to be Satan. You're going to be a cop. That's what you're going to be. A lot of parents are going to be dressing their children up as police. Mm. Um, And then Halloween is right before the election. Isn't that fun? Right before uh, the election, which from all uh, the media reports should go off without a hitch. Should be very calm and (laughs) peaceful. The media is literally going out every minute going, uh, there's going to be civil unrest. There's going to be... Uh, I mean, what are we all preparing for? Voting's already started. It's mail-in voting. You can already vote. Trump's telling people to vote twice. Everybody, and I tweeted today, this is so much of a bigger problem than Trump. Trump is a big problem. He's not doing a good job. That being, I mean, that's putting it as mildly as I can put it for you psychopaths out there. They're like, no, (laughs) no. So many people get mad at me when I say that. They're like, no. And here's the other thing. He doesn't like the military. Guys, you know he doesn't like the military. I think that article in the Atlantic should have been sourced, but you know he doesn't like the military. You know he doesn't respect people that wear uniforms for no money. I don't care what you do. Garbage man, uh, anything. He doesn't respect that. He does not like the military. He doesn't give a shit about first responders. He doesn't get it. In his own mind, he doesn't get it. He might not actively hate them. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get it why a guy would wear a uniform and potentially die for a job that pays him 70000 a year, maybe. And that's not even it. I mean, that's like after you've been in for a while. He doesn't get that. You're, you, you don't get Trump if you think 
He's perplexed. I think he's genuinely sure. confused as to why anybody would do anything that doesn't net them a lot of money and the ability to fuck models and live in a mansion or live in a high-rise apartment. Like, he doesn't get it. It's just not his game, you see? It's not what he's into. He doesn't, he doesn't respect, like, uh, EMTs. <laughs> First response. I mean, it's not his thing. You think he really likes the military? By the way, do you really believe when you put your head on the pillow, do you truly believe that Donald Trump understands like the sacrifices that servicemen and women make? Do you believe that? You don't believe Trump's a little confused? You don't think if he looked and goes, you're making $36,000 a year? What are you doing? Get out of here. You don't think he's a little perplexed by that? He doesn't get it. What does he do that's not for him? What has he ever done in his entire life that doesn't directly benefit him? Well, the presidency. I love that. People go, well, he's president. And he's actually losing money. Being pre he's not. And also, people. there's some people that would argue being the leader of the free world's a benefit. Some people would say that that's a benefit. So he's not actually, it's not a selfless pursuit. You see, controlling a nuclear arsenal, the world's, you know, most powerful military, running, you know, the economy, you know, to the extent he wants to or can, that's not exactly a, a step down from where he was. So he doesn't like the military. I mean, it's just what it is. There's a great part in that Atlantic article. This is an article, if you don't know, came out in the Atlantic magazine. Jeffrey Goldberg, who's the editor of the Atlantic. Uh, some of their shit's fine that they write, and some of it I don't like. I think this should have been on the record, by the way. Fox News, though, did confirm a few high-ranking oh, really? Trump administration officials that were on board with this. Uh, the military does not want him in. They do not want him in. So you can continue to like and love and support him. The military doesn't want him. They want people... They want recruitment numbers up, and the recruitment numbers don't aren't high if you're joining the military and you think you're going to fight your friend in the street. So when Trump says we're going to send the military in everywhere, you might agree with it. You might say we need law and order, but it doesn't exactly help. It doesn't drive recruitment numbers if you think you're going to be deployed on, on your streets fighting. Nobody really signs up for that. So the military... It's just a lot of them are just not a fan of this guy. Some of them are. Some of them certainly are. But a lot of them are. And they know he doesn't respect what they do. <laughs> they know that. And you know that if you think. Doesn't respect. Can you imagine explaining to Trump why you joined the military? Like, I believe that I'm making a sacrifice for other people's freedom. His eyes would glaze over in his head like you were speaking an alien language. By the way, my eyes almost glaze over <laughs> in my head when you tell me that's why you're joining the military. I am a little like, what? I'm like, and by the way, I'm glad people do it, but after we know what the leaders of this country ask these people to do, I'm a little like, Really, like, I would understand much more if a guy goes, I love killing, I can't kill at home, I gotta kill abroad. And then I go, okay, he goes, I like violence, that's how I come. I enjoy making someone go bye-bye. And I know that that's not everyone in there, there's a lot of people in there that do believe in ideals, and that's great, but there's a few people in there, there's certainly a few, there's a couple of people in there that really just want to bathe themselves in blood, and I would understand that as an explanation almost a little more than somebody who's like, I just want to secure our freedom, and I go, okay, good for you, again, I don't understand it either, so stop pretending that Trump understands it. Like, I barely understand. Let's be very honest. You don't understand that. <laughs> and if you did, you'd be there. Unless you are in the military and, and, and thank you for your service and everything. Whatever. <laughs> I do thank you for your service. I mean, some of it. Some of it I thank you for. Some of it I think we got to stop doing. I got to be honest. It's half and half. Some of your service I say yes. And some of it I go, we can't do that anymore. It's a problem. But I don't understand. Do you understand it? Of all the jobs you could get, it's hard to understand, right? It's very hard to understand. I'm going to back up Trump here a little bit. It's a little difficult to understand. I'm kind of with him. 
If we were eating a steak on the Upper East Side of Manhattan and Donnie turned to me and goes, what the fuck are they doing? I'd go, yeah, I don't know. Donnie, yeah, I don't really know. It's freedom and it's our freedom. And they, he'd go, thank God someone's doing it. And then we'd have a nice little cheesecake. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, stop the fantasy that this guy is like some a proud military historian who loves. The military just not what it is. I know we need a military. They need to be strong. They need to kick ass. Some, some of my fans are in it. I'm fucking happy they do it. I wish they had better civilian leadership. I wish the people in the military cared more. And I don't mean the, the rank and file. I mean the brass. And more so than even the brass, the politicians. Those are the problem. I wish they cared more about veterans. Yes. And I wish we had better veteran health care, mental health care, all of that shit. 100%. Okay? But let's just analyze. For example, let's just take a look at the decision. That level of selflessness of bravery, uh, you know, in many cases, we're excluding now the sociopaths who just want to watch things blow up. We're saying the other people, that is hard to understand. I don't, I don't want to go to Iraq. I don't. It's a little difficult to grasp. And I know that, and I know that we're all, you know, everyone's horrified that Trump, but what do you, most guys that make millions and millions of dollars don't understand people that do anything, especially if it could kill them for, for not a lot of money. They don't get it. But people get, people get high on different things in life, right? Some people like danger. Some people like risk. Some people like physical physicality. They want to be out moving. They want to work with their hands. Some people want to sit behind a desk. I mean, all those Wall Street fucks, their risk is, is financial, you know, primarily. Like, they're not putting the, their bodies in danger, but they're putting, you know, they might be putting... Uh, their family or their their financial, uh, you know, their entire enterprise at risk all the time, depending on the decisions they make. And that could affect themselves, their company, their employees, but they don't put their body in danger. So it's hard to explain to guys like that why you would do a job that might get you killed. It's tough. You know, when people become cop, I don't understand why anyone becomes a cop either. I don't get it. I get firemen because it's fun because there aren't a lot of fires and they don't really do much and they have these big meals in the firehouse and and the first guy I sucked off was a I think a volunteer fireman. I don't even know, but something it was after 9/11 he was trying to do it. I don't know if he ended up doing it or not, but he had a huge dick and I always remember his dick like the, all firemen have that dick where it's like not insanely long but fat like a hose you could use. <laughs> now I don't know what happened to that person. I assume he's dead. <laughs> but I'm kidding, of course, about there not being fires. There are fires in Los Angeles all the time. There's so many fires, it's kind of embarrassing. Right. But everyone's like, are you donating to the firefighters? It's like, not really, because the fires come back every year. So we're at a certain point now where it's like, I just don't know if we're going to get, we're just throwing good money after bad here. It's like, guys, can you do a job or not? I mean, you do the job, and then two weeks later, there's fires back. So I'm no expert, and yet I still think that's not really a good track record, okay? People are getting evacuated three or four or five times out of their fucking houses. But I understand that job. But if somebody tells me I'm going to be a beat cop, I'm just going to walk around. And we need them. We need people to do these jobs. But let's be, but let's be a comedian. That's a great thing. Who the fuck? On, can, go explain that to someone. Yes, I'm going to work for 10 years and be broke and maybe even longer than that on the off chance that maybe I, I figure out how to be funny and then an even slimmer chance that I can market that to people and make a living doing that. And it's a brutal process. So people don't understand that. No one understands anything really other than like, oh, you make money, got a big house. So if I do the job that makes me, I get the house and the money and the car, I get that. But anything that you do that doesn't immediately net you financial results, nobody in America understands. I don't understand it. And I do one of those things. I spent a decade doing it. I, it was just like a weird calling. It was something I had to do. And maybe that is the military. But Trump doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand a calling. He doesn't understand like higher purpose or the idea that this is what you should do in your life. He doesn't get that. Everything's a game. This is he's a casino magnet. He's playing a game. And why play such a game that could kill you? Why play a game that could knock you out? 
And that's that's a fact. And that's just what it is. I understand, you know? But it would have been nice if they sourced the article. I don't know. Maybe they will. Folks, a lot of us are starting uh, businesses online. We know it. It's the way of the future. You got to get on the internet. This is it. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're this is uh, commerce here, you know? You want to make a little bit of money. Maybe you're an artist. Maybe you are uh, whatever you are, and you're shipping things, right? You want to ship your work, your wares. Maybe you are somebody that's collected a lot of cool stuff, collectibles. You want to get them out of your hair. It's people want to buy them. Whatever you're doing, whether you're an artisan, a creator, whether you're uh, some type of broker, whatever you are, if you need to ship things and you have an online business, you should be using ShipStation. ShipStation is the easiest way for a small, medium-sized, large, or growing business to manage their outgoing shipping orders. This is essential. You don't want to get bogged down with all of the orders and all the things you're sending out. ShipStation allows you to easily streamline everything you're doing. You want to focus on your craft, your business, marketing, building, getting your uh, you know name out there to more people. What you don't want to function, I mean, what you don't want to focus on is the functionality of of your back end office and that's where shipstation comes in they are really enabling you very easily to to basically ship things to people all over the country and the world right they ship everywhere and it's so important that you have the confidence in the service provider that you are using to do this it is essential the great things that ShipStation does is they uh, allow you easily to scale up or down their services depending on the volume of business you're doing at the moment. Also, they easily create a system which allows you to track all of the orders that you send very, very easily. None of this is difficult, even for people that are not technologically gifted, like myself and many other creative geniuses out there. We can't be bothered with the nuts and bolts, humdrum shipping crap. We need an infrastructure behind us that allows us to send stuff out there and to know that it's arriving safely and securely to the people who've chosen to buy it. Worry about growing your customer base. Do not worry about how those orders are going to be shipped. That is the job of a ship station. And it's very, very important that you spend all of your effort and energy on what got you to start that business in the first place, whatever it happens to be. Could be your creativity, your business acumen, whatever it is. Let them do the nuts and bolts. Let them do the back office work, and, and you can easily track it. So we have a very special offer for people that are uh, joining ShipStation with the Tim Dillon Show. And Benjamin Avery, who's back now, will be telling everyone about what that offer is. What is it? So the Tim Dillon Show listeners can try ShipStation free for 60 days. What? 60 days for free. Free shipping yeah. for 60 days of a business you've just started? Mm -hmm. That sounds too good to be true. You just have to use offer code Tim Dillon. That's it? Mm -hmm. That's all I have to use is offer code Tim Dillon, and then I'm taking all of my shipping um, expenses, you know? The same as a Fortune 500 company. They use ShipStation. And and yeah. and I get to use it for free for two months. Yeah, you just have to click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Tim Dillon. That's ShipStation.com. Then enter offer code Tim Dillon. T I M D I L L O N. ShipStation.com. Make ship happen. I mean, if you're not doing that, you're crazy. You get 60 days of trying this amazing service for free. After that, you're definitely going to be hooked, and it'll allow you to grow your business safely, securely. That's the move. Ridge Wallet. Yum. Ridge Wallet is an easily sanitized, easily concealed wallet. And in these times of chaos, looting, rioting, uh, pandemics, I mean, the plagues, biblical plagues, mm -hmm. don't you want a small sliver of carbon fiber in your wallet? You don't want some big leather grotesque thing that's falling apart that little diseases can live in the crevices of. You want a small wallet that allows you to easily organize yourself. Put a debit card, a credit card, maybe a $100 bill, your attorney's phone number, uh, next to kin, whatever it is. Uh, the, the Ridge Wallet makes you... Streamline. It makes you organized. It makes you realize what is important and what isn't important. It's also an easy front uh, front pocket wallet, and it doesn't even look like a wallet, so nobody's going to say, let's rob that guy. Important right now to have that kind of thing. It's also stylish. It comes in what again? 
titanium, carbon fiber, all these cool things. So cool. Aluminum. Yeah. Aluminum. There's different colors. I mean, you're going to love it. I'm telling you right now. God, are you going to love ShipStation? You're going to say to you, I mean, God, are you going to love Ridge Wallet? Ridge Wallet is so great. Um, everyone I know has a Ridge Wallet, and if they don't have a Ridge Wallet, I don't even speak to them. I don't want anything to do with them because it means they're not taking their life seriously, and I am. I am taking it seriously. I want to be safe and secure, and so do you. Buy them for your children, your family. Be a Ridge Wallet family. Easily sanitize it. Put it between your hands. With a little sanitizer and boom, you got a safe Ridge wallet with no germs. Isn't that nice? It's important. And I believe Ridge Wallet, they've partnered with our show for so long. They're so important. They're offering a special offer right now. And it's very, very important that we tell you what this offer is. You get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com slash 10. 10% off and free shipping? And returns, yeah. And returns if you don't like it, and you're going to love it because it's got over 20,000 five-star reviews. You're going to love this wallet. I mean, it changes everybody's life who gets it, but I'm amazed, Ben, that they're going to give you 10% off and free shipping. Yeah, the link is in the description, rich.com oh slash 10. Oh, fucking God. Would you lie about that? It's so easy. It's right there. I put it in the Fucking description. Fucking Christ. You wouldn't lie about that, would you? Never. Because if you don't do this, I'm going to come to your house and kill you. Ridge Wallet. Yum. Get your Ridge Wallet. This article in The Atlantic, and you can just put up, because you have no Wi-Fi and post, you can just throw up these two articles. There's an article in The Atlantic. I'm sorry, there's an article about an article in The Atlantic, and the, it was a cover story in The Atlantic that they did on transgender kids. And I'm going to try to get this right here because I don't, uh, you know, I, I it's so hard to talk about without misgendering somebody, and I, I, I'm we do not have the Wi-Fi, so I do. I know that the person on the article is now going by the he/him pronoun. Okay. At the time, they were going by the they/them pronoun, and I believe potentially before that, they were biologically born a female because we gotta say that, right? Because that's the whole thing about transgender is that someone has a thing with their biological sex, they have an issue with it, and they want to. So I'm trying to discuss this respectfully, okay? I just don't have the wife. I don't have the Wi-Fi, so I'm trying to remember who everybody is at any given moment. It's a little difficult. It's a little trying. Um, the person shows up, they, because at the time they were they, they should, because it's a journey, I think, from, from, from female to they to male, perhaps, in this person's case, right? We're all people. So... They show up to just do a photo shoot for LGBTQIAXLEZKNI. I was going to spell the N word a little bit and then pull back from it because, but I, I realize that that's just not even funny. But I was just going to say N I G just as a joke and then pull back from it just to see if any of you are paying attention, but none of you are. The point I was saying is that these, these children show up to get the photos taken. The Atlantic then makes them sign, you know, that standard release. We can use it anywhere in the magazine, wherever we want. They put this person on the cover of the Atlantic and say, your kid is trans. The, the, the kid had no idea they were going on the cover. Their parents didn't know. The kids, I think uncle or grandfather, I don't have Wi-Fi, had a subscription to the Atlantic and ended up being like, oh man, this is blank. I don't know the name. This is that person that we know. Um, and so the, the, the kid, and they also misgendered the person. They mischaracterized the whole thing. It's really crazy. And I, and I read the article and, uh, and again, it's it was a real, it was an article about what to do or the debate around uh, children who want to transition, okay? Which I'm not saying anything about right now. I, I can't I can't wade into this. I don't have children. You know, there's a certain point where I, you got to step back. You can't be in every fight all the time. Right. 
I've said before, and I stick with it, I don't think anyone should do anything at nine. People should wait till they're older. <laughs> I don't know if that age is 18 or if it's in their teen. I don't know what it is. I'm just saying I don't think anyone should be making life-changing decisions at six. But I don't have kids. I'm not. I'm really not. If I can't get involved in all the fights, I can't. I can't be involved in everything. I everything can't be. God bless these people. That every day, Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying and all these things. Every day they, every day Heather Hying's like, hello, it's Heather Hying. <laughs> hello, it's Heather. And then Brett's like, hello, Heather. Today, as Portland is bombed. We're going to sit here with our cat and discuss, you know, and it's like, I understand, I get it, and I'm sure everyone's serving a function. I just can't be involved. I have to, I have to step back. I mean, I have to draw a circle around myself and only care about certain things. I, you know, it is what it is here. If I have a child, if I have a child, I will encourage that child to be a financial criminal, regardless of gender. I will encourage that child to go into <laughs> banking, to live in the Hamptons, to have a, you know, to live in the city, to have a home in the Hamptons. I will want that child to work in private equity or hedge funds. I will, I, I, my, I, I, and like the, like the transgender person on billions, the non-binary person on billions. I would hope that that is my child. I would hope that my child, in addition to being non-binary, would be um, kind of a numbers whiz with a real, real kind of loose sense of morality that could infiltrate an institution. And that, that would be my hope. I mean, that would be my hope. I don't think I'll adopt a child, but if I do adopt a child, when I sit down with the adoption agency, I'll say, is there any way that we can know which one, um, you know, will be a criminal? Because I would want that one, like an intelligent criminal, not an idiot in a bodega, go get your money, but like a fun criminal, because that I would want to give that kid advice. And I think, you know, when I'm older in my life, if I have a child, if I have the the, you know, if, if I adopt, if I'm in a relationship with somebody who's sober, which is a big, and they're, uh, you know, not in jail or something, and we want to have a child or like raise a kid, which I don't think, sometimes I think about like, I don't know, like I think about getting a dog, I have a dog for an hour and then you go, this is enough. So, uh, but it might be nice to raise a kid, but I'd want the kid to do something. I'd want a, a fucking real deal, like Olympic kid like I'd, I wouldn't want a humdrum regular loser I'd really want like a kid who was like obsessed with sports or you know a chess grandmaster you know not like Bobby Fisher who just when it, he just starts talking about the Jews but I mean someone who just displays a tremendous amount of skill at something I want a driven kid you know I want a kid that it's hard to relate to I open the door to his or her room or their room and uh, they just kind of look at me with disgust because they have no respect for me because they're like, yeah, you have a big house, but you're a fat clown. You know, what are you really? What are you? What's your legacy? Like, I want my kid to say to me, what's my legacy? And I want to crumble. Like, I don't think I have. I don't. And I could just say, you know, comedy doesn't really age. I don't know. You know, but I want my kid to be like a stone cold little psychopath. That's what I want. I don't know if I can get that. I don't know if I'll get that, but that that's kind of what I want. Like a tough, sharp, you know, I mean, that's, that's what I would like if I, if I had the chance to, to have a child, you know, that's all, you know, it's also like what kind of grandparents would my child have? Because my mother is insane and my father is, has a putting green in his backyard. So it's like, what exactly am I bringing the child into the world in terms of grandparents for? Like what guidance will, my child will clearly get no guidance from my parents, you know, who gave me no guidance and uh, gave themselves very little guidance. So my parents, like many boomers, are just on a sailboat sailing. <laughs> the wind is blowing them around and they'll land where they land. Um, so the idea of, you know, like where's grandma and grandpa, you know, where's grandma? Well, grandma's in a mental institution and grandpa's uh, putting in his backyard, you know? But the election's going to be fun, folks. Get ready for the election. It's it's going to be a fun one. And I, I do think democracy has not worked. Can we say that? Can we put that out there as a thesis? <laughs> Can we throw that out as a thesis and then work backwards from there? Yes or yes? I'm, I'm asking you, do you look around and feel that democracy has really worked? 
Maybe it hasn't even been tried. I mean, we're a republic. We're not a democracy. But uh, we're not even that. We're more like an oligarchy. And then that's also failing, right? The oligarchy is kind of failing because, you know, Dave Smith made a good point about this. I'm not a libertarian, but I do like Dave a lot. Um, people, we, we all know the people are nuts. You know, the people, the, the, a lot of the BLM Antifa types that are like knocking over restaurants are nuts. We know that. We see them. We go, that's a crazy person. We see, we, we say that's a crazy person because we know there's no root from what they're doing to anything better, right? We know that by knocking over brunch tables, we're not going to, we're not getting to an equitable fair uh, society where people are treated with respect. And, and it's also the wrong goal, by the way. The goal should be uh, to change laws and to have laws um, govern people's lives so that they have uh, the maximum amount of opportunity. The goal should not be um, to uh, create or change everything at once because none of that ever happens or ever works. Um, it sh we sh they there should be specific pinpoint focus on things that are fucking people and that you can change and and that it you it shouldn't just be this broad eat the rich horse shit that never works never has worked um and and the other side of eat the rich is just some type of authoritarian uh socialist uh state that is run by people that will uh, corrupt like every leader does and then run the state into the ground and run everybody uh, that lives there into the ground as well. Um, that's just historically what has happened, right? There's no, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't, like the carried interest loophole on Wall Street, you should eliminate. That should be a folk, get rid of that first. Doesn't mean you don't do anything else, but it means like there's things you can actually fucking do or try to do. Um, but we know that the people knocking over the brunch tables are nuts. And we know on the other side, the people that are walking around talking about an ethno state, uh, you know, with AR-15s, you don't really want to throw your hat in with those people either. That's just not what you, you look at both groups of people, you go, I bet they're not going to run a real great society if we give them the opportunity, right? 17-year-old gamers who want to bring back the monarchy versus fat non-binary women from Seattle. Both options, nugget for society. But we forget, and this is Dave Smith's point, how radical the center is. How crazy the center is. How truly detached the elites are, the center. They have also left the planet. The center... And I don't mean the, the the majority of people in America. When I say the center, I mean the people that have any power, any influence, the people that are elected, the people that are behind the people that are elected. Those people as well are completely out of it. The centrists, the ones in the middle, cannot just be for eternal war and a financial system that crushes people and, and, and no health care. And that's the center. Those are the safe people. That's the safe choice. Just unending war. Manipulating fucking, you know, currency, crashing economies all over the world, driving our economy off a cliff every seven years in his boom and bust cycle. You know, charging off all of our debt, letting it be serviced by all these other countries. That's the center, and that's also a big problem. I think people forget that because it's easy to point out how crazy the people on the streets are. But why are the people on the streets? Because the center, the people in the suits, the people that look respectable, the people that have lovely families, and you go sit down with them, you have lunch with them, when they start talking, you go, oh, you as well are fucking insane. <laughs> you as well have lost it. I was in the Hamptons talking to people. They're going, Isn't the, aren't the problems mainly on Twitter? I'm like, they're burning down. What? The cities are falling and you people are drinking rosé in your backyard. They don't have a clue. They're out of it. They're living in this insular bubble. They have no idea what is happening. And they're the center. They are the Buttigieg, Klobuchar, centrist. They're not people that you would ever uh, point out and go, that's a lunatic. But when you hear them talk and when you realize that the policies they face, they don't think it's a problem 
that we have the level of wealth inequality that we do. They don't think it's an issue. Um, and I and I and one of them said to me, they go, one of them said, well, wait a minute. They go, what is this? Uh, what's the problem with this uh, wealth inequality? So I'll give you a few problems. But I said the the one the one major one of the major issues that I can because I'm 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 smart enough to realize I'm not going to try like an emotional appeal with these people. I said a lot of if you have a, a small group of people that have all of the money, they also have all of the political power. So the problem is that in a democratic system or a republic or whatever we fucking are under the impression this thing is, if you give all of the money, if the money is earned and hoarded and kept by one small group of people, they also make all of the decisions, uh, syringe in your ass, Bill Gates, you know, so that becomes an issue too. And, um, and they said, oh, well, I can see your point there a little. I go, yeah, a little bit, I see that. I said, you see, the so people don't have any power anymore. Right. I see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then one of them goes, well, they can vote. That's what they say. Right. You can vote. Right. Just vote. What's the problem? And I'm like, yeah, but the <laughs> lobbying and the, the legalized bribery, the bribery that isn't legal, the blackmail, right. all the uh, skullduggery, all the fun that you people have been having forever. Yeah, that that kind of that that kind of overrides the vote, doesn't it? I'm not saying you shouldn't vote, um, and I'm not saying, by the way, that the opposite of voting is like let's go fuck up a brunch, because somehow then these people are going to be dethroned. But the centers is is fairly radical. It's it's wild when you talk to people, and they're not radical in their appearance, and they're not radical in um in in many of their beliefs. Like many of them are are pretty you know, regular, you know, down the, down the middle kind of, play. but when you start talking to them, we're all radicalized by our self-interest. This is really what it comes down to. I think that's part of the issue. The radical nature of a lot of people's beliefs. Um, sometimes it goes against their self-interest. Um, but a lot of times it is perfectly in line with what they want either the world to look like uh, and even if you don't understand someone's self-interest, like you look at all these rich kids uh, saying that they want communism, you know, that doesn't make any sense. It does when you realize that they actually just want anyone to pay attention to them. And that that's the one thing they haven't been able to buy is th their value and worth as a human being. So that's why they're, they're walking around unironically calling themselves Maoists walking out of Starbucks with a cold brew and then and, and then stomping around the suburbs saying that they're Maoists. They just want fucking attention. So that is in their self-interest. But I mean, all these Wall Street fucks out there in the Hamptons, and I only spoke to a handful of them, but the ones that I spoke to are, are incredibly detached from what is actually happening out there. They just don't care. And, and when they talk about it, their belief, it is a radical belief to say, is aren't the problems just on Twitter? That's a pretty radical, wild take. Because they they can afford the news. Many of them are friends of the people <laughs> who run those companies. You know the news, right? You could just turn it on or glance at it <laughs> occasionally, and you would see how big these problems are and how widespread they are. To say something like, isn't it mainly on Twitter, shows that you're just so completely removed from it. And that's why a lot of these elites are just incapable of charting the right course for America. So, so if Trump leaves, don't think for a minute that... The people coming in, I mean, Biden was chosen because he is a corpse. Make no mistake. He was chosen because he is a corpse and because he's a company man and he's going to go in there and they're going to keep with the same policies and the same attitude that created Trump. That type of empire at all costs, fuck the people mentality, uh, politics is Beyonce shaking her ass and having a trans Batman. That <laughs> level of commitment to the American people, workers can fuck off, people that have families can fuck off, 
Uh, you know, but if you want to jet around to Little St. James, you'll have the best legal defense possible. Um, but politics being primarily the color of the superhero is has not worked. And that's what it is. A very aesthetic, optics-based politics in which nothing gets done by design and little people get little uh, breadcrumbs, a little nugget of this and that. Here you go. Enjoy this. Obama came in, tried. You know, that didn't work. Doesn't mean that, uh, you know. So that's just, that's how radical. And, and, and. As far as the Antifa people, can you start knocking over Hollywood restaurants? Stop with these like mm -hmm. middle class or upper middle class brunch places in DC. Start knocking over restaurants at Beverly Hills because here's the deal. They're gonna the, the celebrities are kind of gonna have to agree with you. Like that's what's gonna be funny about it. They're gonna have to agree with you. They're gonna have to like Sofia Vergara is gonna have to throw a fork and say Black Lives Matter. They're going to have to do it. Like Reese Witherspoon's going to have to kind of go along with the chant. Like she might be sitting there completely like, wow, but she is going to have to be a little bit like as they come in and start, you know, doing the table, she's going to have to sit there and kind of go like, like, black lives matter. I agree. Like that, because these celebrities kind of have to do it, right? Aaron Paul, that guy from Breaking Bad. Let me go to a restaurant he's at. You know, they're gonna go to go 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 to where Bette Midler's hanging out. They're gonna have to agree, right? Mm -hmm. They can't be like this is absurd. No, they're gonna have to say yes, D yes, destroy it, <laughs> yes, beat me with a salt and pepper shaker. Why not? I believe I agree with this. I agree with you. I'm agree. Look at me agreeing. <laughs> Yes, dude, the dude in the restaurant Beverly Hills, these fucking idiots will sit there and be like, yes, good, we agree. And of course, the poor restaurant owner will watch his restaurant get trashed while these celebrities sit there and, and cheer it on. Cheer it on, let, let, let that happen. Why not? Better help H-E-L-P, folks. I'm telling you, better help. H-E-L-P. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Many times I have those problems. I get up and I'm sad or too happy. Sometimes too happy is a problem. People don't realize that. But when you're too happy, it's very off-putting. People don't like that. I certainly don't. So how do you get even keel? You can start communicating in under 48 hours with better help. It will help assess your needs and match you with a licensed professional therapist. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may, or, which may or may not be locally available in many areas. You might not get it in many areas you're living in, but you can get it with better help because it's online, especially now with COVID, a pandemic, you want to be online. I'm telling you right now, you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room like traditional therapy. Better help, H-E-L-P, is committed, is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. So they make it easy and free to change counselors if you need. It is more affordable than traditional online, offline counseling. And financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. It's so easy. If you got problems, you want to talk them out. These are real counselors, real therapists. They got licenses. You don't have to drive there, get parking. It's expensive, COVID. You have to sit in an office while some of the therapists you don't know is chewing on a bat. This is a healthy way to live your life. Go to their website, www.betterhelp.com slash Tim D. That's betterhelp.com slash T-I-M-D. And join over the 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Special offers for the Tim Dillon Show listeners. They get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Tim D. 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Tim D. It's such a good idea. So many people are walking around right now and they're absolutely fucking insane. And it's just better for them to get help. Some people tell me, you know what they say to me sometimes? They go, I'm getting help. 
And you know what I say to them? I look them in, in their face and I say, you're getting help? And they go, yeah. I said, why don't you get better help? How about that? You know what they say to me? They say, what should I do? And I go, you go to betterhelp.com slash Tim D, better H E L P dot com slash Tim D. Do it, guys. Do it to support not only your mental health, but more importantly, my show. Do it. It's so important for everybody to have a nice, nice stuff going on in their head. Nice stuff going on up there in their head. It makes it better. And it makes it help. Better. Help. The football season is less than 10 days away with the reigning champs set to take the field to kick off the season. There is no better place to get in on all the action than with DraftKings, the leader in one-day fantasy sports. To celebrate week one of the football season, DraftKings is putting you in the center of the action with two shots at a $1 million top prize. So get in on all the action now. Make it rain with DraftKings. It's easy. Draft your team, stay under the salary cap, and pile up points for yards, touchdown, and so much more. On top of that amazing offer, DraftKings is giving away of a share of up to $100 million in prizes. Do you see uh, $100 million? Wow. In prizes to all the users who enter their free, free football survivor pool. All you have to do is sign up for DraftKings, enter their survivor pool, and you'll be instantly get a share of one hundred of up to $100 million in their giveaways. With all this cash up for grabs, there is no better place to get in on the action with DraftKings. It's so important. So many people are having so much fun. It's very, very important. And I think it's important that you get in with DraftKings. Because you can have fun, you can build your team, there's so many prizes to win, there's so much cash to win, you're going to do this stuff anyway, why not get involved and win a little cash? A little ca do you like cash? Yes. Do you like prizes? Love it. The fuck you do. <laughs> so get on the DraftKings. Download the top-rated DraftKings app now and use promo code DILLON, D-I-L-L-O-N, to get a free shot at a million-dollar top prize. And for limited time, get a share of $100 million. That's fucking Oprah money. $100 million in prizes once you start, once you enter DraftKings' free survivor pool. That's promo code DILLON to get in on all of the action. DILLON for limited time only at DraftKings. Minimum $5 deposit required. Other terms and conditions and eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. DraftKings.com. It's party time. Are you going to party with $100 million worth of prizes or are you not? Because I know where I'm going to be, building the team, entering the survivor pool, and get my fucking cash. Get my cash. And if I've understood this ad, if you enter, you get $100 million. <laughs> that's what the ad says. If you enter this, someone shows up your house with $100 million, and I think that's nice. Promo code Dylan. D-I-L-L-O-N. DraftKings.com. Football. Money. Yeah. We went to a restaurant the other night. We were inside. We were in North Salem. Um, there's a nice area. Letterman lives out there. A nice area in New York. And I was there with a few people. And the food was so bad. But it was just so fun to complain about. You know, to each other, we didn't tell the restaurant. A few of the women at the table were like, we should, you know, we should fucking lay. And because, you know, that area is just all wasps. And wasps don't complain about food. Jews do. So that's why, you know, where Jews live, you get good food because they'll complain. And ethnics will complain. Um... And people like my mother, like she's who's Irish cat, but wasps are above, you know, above everything in their own head. So they don't complain. They, they don't like, they don't complain because a wasp doesn't want to even have eye contact with the server. They don't even want to discuss anything with the help. So if the Dover sole wasn't good, it's like, whatever. Doesn't matter. Wasps just want to be around other wasps. So as long as the restaurant looks like an old inn that George Washington would go to, right. and as long as it looks like that, and as long as that uh, we uh, the uh, makeup of the restaurant is pretty uniform, <laughs> if you know what I mean, the wasps don't really care. They just, you know, they go in with their boat shoes. They sit very quietly. They have very quiet, respectful conversations. And then... You know, the dudes go home and watch porn that would make your eyes bleed. I mean, the things that those people probably watch. But 
that's what they do. And, and I'm in there with ethnics. We got Italians, Greeks, we got Jews, we got, it was ethnics in there. And people, you know, we're loud and we're fat, some of us, not all of us, but some of us. And, and you know, we're like, you know, a, a couple of them were like, I want to, you know, we shouldn't be paying for this. I was like, I agree. But we didn't, we didn't complain. Obviously, we're not, we're not trying to hurt anybody. Um, but it was just so fun to sit around inside in a restaurant. We said we wouldn't think we'd be doing this to just sit here. It's a real luxury to sit there and complain about food that isn't good. There's sometimes it's really fun to go to a restaurant where everything is bad. You know, my uncle works for a restaurant group in Manhattan, and they are some of the best steakhouses in the country. Quality meats and quality Italian and Smith & Walensky's. They're just legendary spots. They're really good. Maloney and Porcelli and Park Avenue. I mean, they're, they're part of the fabric of what makes New York dining great. I mean, the guy that he works for uh, started TGI Fridays. I mean, these are legendary people. But they opened a restaurant called Quality French, which was, and I took two of my friends there, the history hyenas, Chris and Giannis, and I, I, to say that the experience was atrocious, I mean, his restaurant, they love doing fun things. Like in one of their restaurants, Quality Italian, they have a uh, chicken parm shaped like a pizza. So they like doing fun table side shit. You know, they finish the penne alla vodka with the lobster. They finish it with a flame next to the table. And they're, you know, it's, it's a show. It's theatrics. So the first thing they do, they come over here as they go, they have herbed butter. They bring out a hunk, and I mean a hunk like this big, like the size of like a, like a small box of butter. Just seeing that amount of butter was so viscerally disturbing that we were like, our stomach started to churn. Then the food started to come out, and I mean, it was bad. everything was bad. The French onions. I went to the manager afterwards, and I said, "Listen, I come to these restaurants a lot. I love them. This experience was atrocious, and I am now very upset." And I said, "I don't know." And she was like a sweet older Asian woman. She's like, "I understand." I'm like, "I don't, I don't know when I will be able to make this okay in my own head. What just happened here? Because what happened here was an act of war." The the mo the chocolate mousse, you know how the chocolate mousse is done in a way that it makes it look like ice cream? They decided to not do that. They decided to smear it on a slate to make it look modern. And you know what it looked like? Dog shit. <laughs> Actual shit. It looked like I had stepped, it looked like a slate of concrete sidewalk with a smear <laughs> of dog shit on it, and I called the manager over. I said, "Let me ask you a question. What does this look like?" She said, "What?" I said, "What does it look like?" If I had to ask you to describe this in a few words, what would you say it looked like? And she looked down, and she said, "It kind of looks like poop." I said, "Yes, it looks like poop." <laughs> Correct. Why is it on my table? Why did we pay $18 for shit? It was an atrocious experience, but we had so much fun shitting on the experience. We had so much fun seeing something go wrong. There's, there's nothing better. When I used to eat out in New York, I'd eat alone at the bar a lot. And you'd watch these restaurants struggle to keep up with the flow of a Friday night or something. And you'd just see the wheels come off and the waiters start to go nuts and shake. And you'd hear glasses dropping and people like getting upset. And then the kitchen door would open. You just hear brief screaming before it closed again. And, you know, people were getting reamed out and they were in the weeds, you know, it was tough. And I would just watch that. And there was really nothing that made me happier than just watching that operation just at the, at, at the brink, just buckling under the pressure of the flow of people, nasty, loud, tourists, demanding New Yorkers, just a cocktail of horror. And they didn't keep coming, they kept coming. And I just sat at the bar and would just chew a soft ciabatta, just, and watch. Watch people lose their minds. Watch them curse the decision they made to move to New York to be an actor or a this or a that. Watch them curse their coworkers. Watch their hearts fill with hatred while this was happening. I watched customers roll their eyes, hold glasses up in the air for more water, pound on the table 
wanting to get the attention of the server. Crowd the maitre d's, similar to the way the BLM folks are doing now, almost in a threatening posture. But this wasn't about equality. It was about calamari. But I've watched all of that happen, and there's nothing more enjoyable than that, and I don't know why. It's a funny thing, but I don't know why. There's nothing better. I've been at work. I've been, when I was a tour guide, I remember when it was raining and people were screaming at tickets. They were trying to get on the double-decker bus that I was a tour guide of and they couldn't get on and I had to hang over the bus. And go, I'm sorry, another bus is coming. And the people, you know, would just shout in all their different accents. They'd go, liar, liar. Saying liar because they knew I was lying. <laughs> liar, you're a fucking liar. <laughs> And I'd have to wave to them and the rain was coming down and people, we had to hand out ponchos. We're trying to hand out ponchos on the bus and people are screaming and the, the bus is an old metal death trap. They pay off the city to just say it fucking works. It's weaving side to side and people are screaming because they, they can't make their Broadway show tickets. And they realize that the entire vacation has just been a succession of of stressful moments where they're just trying to move from one thing to the other. So I understand what it's like to be in that position, to be in that nightmarish position. And there's just nothing better than watching it and just kind of eating a soft ciabatta. There's just something about not being at work, just not being there, you know? Was there ever something that went really out of control? Yeah, when we'd serve liquor there on a- Wait, hold on. <laughs> you I'm going to serve... out the name of the store because I can't, I can't legally say You serve liquor yeah. at- I gotta bleep that out again. Yeah. Why? Because it's illegal. It's illegal to do. We would do it on a, like Fourth of July days like that, and usually homeless. people- Are you envisioning? And I'm not gonna say the name again. But are you envisioning people suing or trying to get you in trouble legally? Uh, maybe. I mean, it, okay. It's highly illegal to do. Well then, well then you bleep the two names, and I won't say it again. Mm -hmm. Can I say the genre of store it sure, was? Sure. Sure. It was a pet store. It was a pet store. You were serving alcohol at a pet store. Yeah. Why? To celebrate Independence Day, and we would do it on Halloween. And Why are people celebrating uh, Independence Day at a pet store? Because they want to dress up their pet in the costumes that we have. and have You had beverage. pet costumes as well? Yeah. Fucking wow. I thought it was just mainly like toys, chew toys, and dog food. No, it was the whole works. I mean, it was people that really love their pets came to that store. You know? Was there ever a question about a pet's gender identity? I'm dead serious. No, but people would correct me if I said he or she on accident. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I recall one All person. All pets are it's, <laughs> by the way. They're, it's an it, it. It's a beast. It's a beast. I'm reading a book right now about people. So what would go, to, when you got people drunk, was there ever a situation where you go, this is getting out of control? Yeah, this guy who loved birds came in and he was, he would talk to us for hours and he got, just fucking wasted in the store. And we basically had to ask him to leave because he was just too drunk. But people would just get hammered and just kind of hang out. Uh, a couple of homeless people came in and started drinking. We had to ask them to leave too. Because you can't assume in like Eagle Rock and Silver Lake that someone's homeless until you kind of put two and two together. Don't you know? give people hints about the store now. <laughs> Giving people hints. But there's something nice about being a person who's experienced hell while you work, which that doesn't sound like hell. It just sounds a little annoying. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about real, like, heavy workload. People are going crazy. Right. And um, I've experienced that. So to, to, to not experience that, but to be somewhere where I can observe other people going through that, that's nice. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what all the people in the Hamptons are doing. They're just chewing a soft ciabatta at the bar, mm -hmm. Staring at all of the waiters, trying to make it through the night. Yeah. They're all just sitting at the bar, chewing, just watching, staring at it, looking at it in an academic sense. Not really invested in the outcome. They don't really care if somebody drops a bowl of lobster bisque on the floor. They don't really care if this girl's going to sprain her ankle and not be able to work. doesn't really matter to them. They're just chewing a little roll watching it all go to hell. That's what they're doing, you know? And people have to remember that that's the problem. All of the other things, uh, Trump, people dressed in black, a lot of these people are uh, side effects 
of the medication. But the real issue is the people who drove the country to this point. Those people who still don't care. I mean, they still don't care. I mean, there's riots in this. They still don't care. I mean, things are burning. The air still unconcerned. They still don't give a shit. What would make them care? The White House will be on fire. They'll go, isn't that on Twitter? Isn't that mainly on Twitter? That's an Instagram problem, <laughs> right? What, do they storm the White House? Is that a TikTok thing or is that? No, it's real life. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> you forget how fucking nuts these people are just because they look nice to have collared shirts. They're fucking nuts. I'm reading a book about people disappearing in national parks called, what is it called? Oh, a cold. The cold vanish? The, the cold vanish, yeah. I just picked it out at random in an airport because I do that a lot with books. I usually read a chapter of it and then say I'm going to read the rest and never do. But this book is interesting. People, and I don't really, and, and the reason I don't care this much about this topic is number one, I don't think it's Bigfoot. I don't think it's aliens. I do think people might be getting abducted. I don't care that much about nature or people that really seek out nature. I think they're very sick. I think people, I don't mind, you know, obviously a beach or something like that, but I like civilization. I like small town, a couple of restaurants, and in a natural setting is nice. But I think people that go into national parks are very sick and very ill. And I believe that. I believe if you're looking for, you know, people that set up tents and do like 10 day camping in a national park are very sick people that have a lot to hide. Truly, I believe that. And I believe that if you are in, in those situations, I don't know what the fuck you're into. So I don't know why you disappeared. I don't know what you're doing, but you, you, I think you're very, very sick and I don't know what's going on. I think a light hike is fine, but when you start telling me you're like spending days upon days in Zion National, but I mean, get away from me. Oh, you got to go to Yellowstone. Get away from me. I'll go to Yellowstone for a minute. Hey, look at that. Woo, look at that. Woo, look, look. Out. That's where Satan is. Okay, so anybody that wants to be in the woods for an extended period of time, I believe, is <laughs> out of their fucking mind. I don't know what influence they're under, spiritual or otherwise, but I think it's a big problem. I truly believe that. And I'm not, you know, I know I say a lot of things for effect here, but I, I mean, you know. All these people, Joshua Tree, everybody, I want you got to go to Joshua Tree and take mushrooms and then figure your life out. I'll figure your life out for you first. Instead of going to Joshua Tree, blow your brains out in the car. <laughs> How about that? I'll figure it out. Don't bother the aliens with your life decisions. I'll tell you what to do. Pull off the 10 East and swallow a desert eagle. <laughs> Stop looking for mystical experiences and go to work. <laughs> Jesus Christ, we are a selfish generation of sick fucks. What do you want to commune with the so what? You could get a better deal on sneakers? Give up this mystical realm you all keep fucking around in. You are slovenly selfish pigs. You have no fucking thought in to what it would what are you going to commune with the uh for what what do you think you're terrence mckenna you're going out to joshua tree to get more energy so you can go back to your job ripping people off take shrooms for the fun of it but don't pretend it's some fucking journey you're not a shaman you're not a shaman you work at a, pre, a production company that makes shows about midgets I'm just saying, enough already with the, na the national parks. Who gives a shit? Can we solve the blood in the, sh the streets? The streets are running with blood. Stop with the park all the time and the hiking and the fucking view. I mean, Christ almighty enough. <laughs> Stop fleeing to these fucking parks so you can sit there and get high by rock formations. The earth is burning. <laughs> Civilizations, buildings, bridges, restaurants, schools, hospitals. Let's figure that out. Enough already. 
We want to take like a trip and I hope you get abducted and I hope a bear rapes and kills you. <laughs> Stay the fuck out of nature. It's disgusting. Nothing makes me happier than when Instagram people take a photo on like a cliff and then die immediately afterwards. Nothing fills my heart with hope more than that. And I hope that keeps happening. A little beach is fine. A little light woods are nice. You start going for a week-long trek in the wood, you are, it, there's a problem. And some of these joggers that go into these national parks and get abducted, it's like, just fucking jog on the street. But it's a better, yeah, it looks nice. Well, then you take your risk. But this whole thing, I'm, I'm a little sick of these fucking corporate tech pieces of shit pretending that they give a flying fuck about nature. They don't. They don't. Okay? All these fucking people at, at Burning Man, which is virtual this year, God forbid they not have Burning Man. It's got to be a Zoom meeting of Burning Man. So these people that work at Goldman Sachs who spend their day destroying economies and these people that design, uh, you know, uh, the type of security systems that uh, keep the children in cages for ice. They need to go do a virtual Burning Man this year because it's not like the real thing. They can't dress up like a fucking weird starfish, weird steampunk angel on roller skates and go fuck around in the Black Rock Desert so they can recharge themselves to go sit behind their desk and take more of your freedom and control more of your mind. That's what all those new age Burning Man types are doing. They're leaving that fucking thing and then deleting you on social media. They're, 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 they're a Burning Man and they're like, oh, it's a lot, I love it. I love it. And then they go back to their fucking office and, 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 and they just program fights for you. They just program how many family members you should fight with for the next three months. They just say, oh, yeah. everybody's fucking... It's all fun when you're eating, you know, peyote fucking, you know, frittatas or whatever's going down there. That's my, 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 my opinion on that. Stay the fuck, stop pretending to be some connoisseur of the natural world. You're a demon from hell. Own it. Own it. What happened to the old Wall Street types? Michael Douglas in Wall Street wasn't like, you know what I, you know what I really like? I like winning. I like winning and Yosemite. I love <laughs> Yosemite because the hot springs. No. Own it. Enough with these motherfuckers. Ben has returned to the show. Ben was suspended for a week. He had a suspension uh, because an article came out about him in the LA Times where he was accused of multiple rapes. <laughs> And uh, he was just, and we thought that the punishment for that was a suspension for a week. And one of the one of the women is uh, alleging that he branded her, and uh, so he's now back. And if we're sourcing these claims, and if it is true, he will be suspended for another week, and then that will be <laughs> that will be his punishment. But we're not we haven't we haven't really found the validity in that. We're going to start putting up new dates on Instagram, Tim J. Dillon, D-I-L-L-O-N. Twitter, Tim J. Dillon, D-I-L-L-O-N. Follow me on Facebook, Tim Dillon, timdillancomedy.com. We are going to throw some new dates up. We're back on the road, September, October, November. We've got dates. We're coming to Texas. We're coming to Florida. We are going places. As soon as all of those offers and deals that we have cook in, as long as we can verify that they're going to happen and we can put those tickets on sale, we're going out. We've got some new material, some old material, some crowd work, some riffing, some fucking just having fun talking about this craziness that we're in. Uh, subscribe, rate, review our podcast five stars. Tell friends about it if you like it. Uh, rate us on iTunes. Tell everybody about us. Call Spotify. Tell them to give us a fucking hundred million dollars. Uh, whatever you want to do. This is, uh, we appreciate this. The show's grown dramatically. It's only going to grow more, hopefully, and uh, we're looking at some some new options for later on in the year, early next year. We're going to have a cool new studio. Um, you know, we're taking a lot of the production quality. The videos has gone up. You've noticed we're going 
uh, in a different direction. Hopefully we have a fully functional, like kind of like a late night show that's actually funny. Wouldn't that be nice? An actual funny late night show eventually. So like something that you could actually watch and go, oh, that was comedic and I enjoyed it, which is nothing that is happening right now. There's not one thing you think is funny, truly. There's not what the only funny thing right now truly to watch is the news because literally you watch it and you just see, you know, people climbing through the windows of a Fridays with blow torches and you go, <laughs> <laughs> honey, you got to come in here and see, you got to come in here and see the guy, he's got a bat. He's in, I think it's Ruby Tuesdays. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait for Trump to not, accept the election results or whatever, and there to be like this weird civil war. But by the way, all of this military stuff is there. The military is sending a strong signal to Trump. Don't count on us. That's what a lot of it is. They're sending a strong yeah. signal going, don't count on us. We're not with you. Um, and I just can't wait for that to happen and there to be like some real, uh, just civil unrest and some real problems in the country. And then, uh, you know, uh, one of these guys on Wall Street's, you know, just drinking a Cabernet and he's just sitting there and he just, you know, like turns on the TV and he's just seeing, he's like trying to understand, he's like squinting. He's squinting and he's just seeing, you know, burning and everything like that. And he just, he just kind of shuts it off. And then he goes, ah, you know, it's, his wife goes, what's going on? Is there a problem? He goes, you know, it's, they blow it up, the media, they make it bigger than it is, you know. Everything's fine, everything's okay. And, you know, and he just fucking ignores it fucking lights a cigar and everything like that and then you, he hears like the sound of distant chanting and he goes it's probably it's interesting you know the neighbors are loud they're usually not that loud but I guess they're having an event you know and he smiles he goes it's nice to have parties he remembers when he used to have parties and the chanting's growing louder and he doesn't understand chanting's growing louder and now he's a little curious he gets up he's got the cigar and maybe maybe he's moved on from the Cabernet maybe he's a little sniffed or a brandy or something you know he's in a Macallan a nice whiskey and he he just sees, and all of a sudden, he just sees the, uh, you know, he just sees the people, and many of them are in black, and many of them aren't, and they're just, they're angry, and they're and they're carrying things that look like weapons, you know, batons and clubs and things like that, and maybe one guy's got a chainsaw. And now he's a little nervous. He's a little nervous. He doesn't he doesn't quite understand what's uh, what's going on, you know, and they, they they come into his property and they start lighting it on fire, and now he's. He's a little disappointed, you know. He's he doesn't really mind the house burning down because the house was never what he wanted. He loves the property and he thinks maybe, I mean, I'm insured, maybe I could build something else. So even in the initial stages of them burning his home, he sees the opportunity in it, right? He sees this could be like a blessing in disguise. You know, he sees the thing going up and he goes, Well, eh, you know, I got a good policy on this house. You know, and even if the wife gets it, he goes, you know, me and her haven't been connecting. You haven't been connecting as much, you know? So he sees the opportunity, and I, I mean, I mean, maybe she gets horribly scarred, and he just sends her away to some sanitarium, and then he could kind of, you know, uh, you know, call that waitress at Bobby Vans and say, Harbor, that he really likes, you know? And, you know, because she's an older woman, but she's, you know, big tits, and she gets them, and she likes power, and she appreciates him, you know? And not like his wife does anymore. She doesn't appreciate him. You know, this new one does because, you know, she's new, and new is important, and new is good, you know? And it's been a while since he's had any new. So he's watching his house burn down and he's thinking about maybe his wife being horribly scarred. And, and still, and still there's nothing that's really troubling him. And then a couple of the people start to approach him and he says to himself, yeah, it's, it's not a huge deal. I mean, I'm sure they just want to talk. And then, then they, they kind of start pushing him. And this is when he goes, now his physical safety starts to enter his mind for the very first time in the whole equation and he goes, yeah, this is, you know, this is a real, this is a real issue. And uh, I don't know how I'm going to make it out of this. You know, he's, he's thinking in his mind, does he know any fighting moves? Not really. Not really. You know, he's been in only a few scrapes. He's lost most of them. You know, he's a, he's a wiry frame, small man that made all his money, you know, just, you know, closing down the companies that he imagined big surly guys work at, you know, and. So they're 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 um they're 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 now getting him and now they've hoisted him up and they're carrying him and he's now very uncomfortable because he he now realizes this, that this might just go left here you know like even though he's tried really really hard this just this may not this may not be a good equation this might just end very very badly and he doesn't he doesn't really know where this is going to go and they 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 walk him and then 
they're walking him to a tree in the middle of his property. It's a big tree. He's always loved this tree, you know. And they, they're they just, you know, they, they start tying him around this tree. And he goes, this seems very strange. You know, it reminds him actually of one of these kind of fun rituals they used to do at Bohemian Grove. He thought maybe that was going to be it. He's like, maybe they just want to have fun in nature, you know, nature, huh? But no, they start tying him around a tree, and then they start dousing him with something, and he recognizes that smell. It's kerosene. It's kerosene. And they're dousing him, and finally he goes, oh, I think they're going to light me on fire. He's still very calm and collected, you know? He didn't realize he was going to die like this, but he's had a pretty decent life. You know, he's made a lot of money. Some people have made more. A hell of a lot of people have made less, you know? The kids went to the best schools. He's only cheated on the wife a few times, and he tested himself for STDs before he had sex with her again. He's done everything responsibly and right, you know? And he just, he's there, and he's just, you know, soaked in kerosene. He just wants, he doesn't want to say anything offensive. He doesn't want, he's thinking of legacy now, you know? He's thinking of his legacy. And it's kind of a proud legacy to be burned at the stake in the Hamptons, really by an angry mob, you know, he'll probably be remembered. If he is remembered, it'll probably be with some type of sympathy, right? It'll probably be with some type of sympathy and they're, they're burning them and they're, they, they haven't burned them yet, but they all have torches and they're, they're getting ready to burn him and he's just there and he's, he's doused in kerosene and everything like that. And he's, he's tied to the tree and he finally, he finally starts understanding, you know, that there are some problems in America, there are issues in America there. And he never, he never understood that, you know? And so then they, they start burning him and he's, he's smelling his own flesh burn and the pain is so intense. He's gritting his teeth and his teeth are almost breaking and the blood is kind of oozing out of his mouth. He's just clenching his teeth and he can't even speak. There's so much pain. You know, there's so much pain and he's just, as he drifts off and he's just, again, cooking, tied to a tree in his Southampton home, as he's cooking, the last thing that he thinks to himself is he goes, man, maybe we should have let them get a knee operation. I guess. But then he reminds himself that hindsight is twenty twenty, And he cares. He cares more about the fact that as soon as that house is burned and that that tree is burned and that his body is burned, a nice young family of guys like him will move in there. So even though he's dead, his last thought is, you know what? Fuck him. You know how expensive it is to put in a new knee? A hell of a lot more pricey. If you if you multiply it by the amount of people that really need it, it's a hell of a lot more pricey than just building a new house for a, another hedge fund guy that can just move in there. And that hedge fund guy will look out at that burnt tree and he'll maybe learn a few lessons, but I bet he won't. You know, so even in the last throes of consciousness, he decides against the knee operations. He says, "Fuck it." You know what? The system's important. What is my flesh? What is what do I have to say that will ever be greater than the system? That's what gets people up in the morning, right? My life is nothing. So he kind of has a smile on his face. He has a smile on his face, and it's charred. You can, you can kind of <laughs> see it. But the smile is because the last thought he had, he goes, man, the next guy who buys this property is going to get such a good fucking deal. <laughs> Good night.